Hey, hey, this is Cedric Youngleman, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. In this episode with Rob Rebick, the co-founder of Alpa Premium Meat Bars, we discuss the tech behind 5G, how modern living is loaded with EMFs, their health effects, the concerns, and ways you can reduce your EMF environment. Before we get into this fantastic rip, I want to tell you a short story about my rancher, Leonard, that I got to introduce my family to this weekend at our local farmer's market. Starting in the 1980s, Leonard and Arlene Horak owned cattle, and Leonard worked for his father-in-law, Arlen Taylor. Arlen was a fourth-generation cattle rancher and citrus farmer who was well-respected in Florida. Through the years, Leonard and Arlene had four children, and so the name Circle Six was created. The six to represent the number of members of his family and the circle to represent that no matter the obstacles, the family bond will never be broken. Many changes happened to Circle Six, but through it all, Leonard and Arlene Horak kept Circle Six ranch and farm running. And their promise is and always will be to never forget what Circle Six stands for and where they come from. The six means family and the circle means the bond will never be broken. The Bitcoin Matrix is proud to partner with Circle Six Ranch and Farm, the Florida Beef Initiative and Bitcoin Bay, to offer you a taste of Black Angus beef that's grass-fed, antibiotic-free, and steeped in tradition. My family loves these guys and their beef. It's great to support local Bitcoiners and businesses that are on a mission to fix the money and fix the food. Discover their premium beef selections like the Florida Pasture Beef Box, and join a movement that's restoring Florida's local economy one steak at a time. Energy secured with exceptional flavor and a better way to eat. Go to floridabeefinitiative.com forward slash discount forward slash matrix to buy your beef direct from Circle Six Ranch, where the richness of Florida's ranching heritage meets the unstoppable force of Bitcoin. Pay with Bitcoin and invest in community with every succulent bite. Link for a discount can also be found in the show notes. River is the best place to stack sats and build your Bitcoin wealth. I've been using River for over three years now because they are a Bitcoin-only company that has earned my trust through their proof of work. River built and owns their own infrastructure. Your Bitcoin is your Bitcoin to withdraw at any time. River also has U.S.-based phone support for all clients. Buy Bitcoin at the tightest spreads in the industry. Have peace of mind thanks to River's 100% full reserve cold storage custody and enjoy zero fees on recurring orders. Use my referral link in the show notes to get started and earn up to $100 in Bitcoin. Are you afraid of losing your keys or falling prey to hackers? Thea's self-custody multi-sig vaults empowers you to be the ultimate guardian of your Bitcoin. Share the power of secure Bitcoin with your loved ones like I have. Thea is my favorite multi-sig solution because Thea enables shared custody, making it a family-friendly choice for safeguarding your digital legacy. And for those unexpected moments, Thea's got your back. Their multi-device vaults with both assisted and sovereign recovery options means your Bitcoin is safe always accessible and ready for the future. Download Thea now using the link in the show notes and get your first six months free and get on the new standard in Bitcoin multi-sig security. If you can't sleep at night because you are worried about your Bitcoin security or how your Bitcoin is going to get transferred to your loved ones in the event something happens to you or your wife or husband doesn't want you to buy more Bitcoin because of these exact kinds of concerns, then it's time to get in touch with me. I can help you set up your multi-sig and secure your Bitcoin for decades to come while ensuring you could sleep at night with the right estate planning and asset protection strategies to make sure your Bitcoin is safe for you and your family. Head over to the bitcoinadvisor.com forward slash Cedric, T-H-E-B-I-T-C-O-I-N-A-D-V-I-S-E-R.com forward slash C-E-D-R-I-C now and put some time on my calendar. The link to set up time to talk with me can also be found in the show notes. And now, let's enter the Bitcoin matrix with Rob Rebick, the co-founder of Alpa Energy Bars. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. 
What do you do? You get out. Rob Rebick, co-founder of Alpa, a company on a dedicated mission to provide customers with convenient, nutrition-packed, meat-based snacks, all free from harmful industrial additives. Rob's vision is to champion small, local regenerative farms and ranches by sourcing ingredients locally, thereby contributing to a broader transformation aimed at enhancing the entire food system. Alpa firmly believes that incorporating animal products is a key element of a healthy diet. Rob Rebeck, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix. How are you? Doing great, Cedric. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to chat. I really appreciate your support over the last few months, and I love what you guys are putting out. You know, it really is a new kind of energy bar. Uh, I remember even back in the day, uh, I'll admit it, I would eat like Cliff Bars. A lot of and, us did. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I think too, you know, part of my food journey is is learning about or relearning about advertising and how misleading it could be, and even how a product can change and maybe be starting out as one thing and then get bought maybe by a conglomerate and, and be changed. Uh, but I, I think, and maybe this is uh, not true, don't trust Verify, but Cliff Bar is probably filled with tons of bullshit in there and uh, stuff you don't want to put in your body. It's probably no healthier for you than a Snickers bar. That's um, pretty much my thought. So, you know, I, I definitely get, uh, you know, the need for this kind of thing, but I, I really want to get into it. But Maybe start way before this or a little bit before this. What were you doing before you co-founded Alpa? Right. So I guess I'll dial all the way back to like my childhood days and kind of ramp up pretty quickly through that. I was a boy who grew up in a garage with my dad being a, a pretty top tier motorcycle mechanic, a motorcycle racer. Um so I was usually too little to like get on motorcycles and it really wasn't my interest. So my dad would bring me home like VCRs and like tape players and all these like electronics from the 90s and those kind of things. And I'd sit there and rip them apart, put them back together, build contraptions. So I had a, I had a really early engineering mechanical mindset long time ago. My uncle was an electrical engineer who I looked up to and I just knew my whole life I wanted to be an engineer. And, you know, that kind of went through high school and I was always building stuff, tinkering stuff. Um, and then I went into the University of Idaho and got my master's degree in electrical engineering. And I was so fascinated with the phenomena of light that I went straight into the electromagnetic theory and uh, studied for three years and got my master's in electromagnetics, which is elect electrical engineering. Um, from then I moved back to Boise where I was, where I grew up and I interned at Idaho power, got to see some cool things there, big transmission lines, pretty much looking at how old Boise's electrical system is and how updated it needs to be. Um, and then I moved to Boulder to start a full-time position at a military defense contractor. And that's where I'm at today. But when COVID hit, I had a huge disruption. It's actually funny because when COVID hit, I was like a king because I had this engineering job and I had this office. You see, I built this in one month to work remote because COVID sent us all home. And so I, in one month, I built this whole place up and I was a hundred percent remote employee, you know, working the great life. I come out here, work five days a week, 40 hours uh, during, it was actually two years. So the first two years I was actually doing well received raises and was a pretty stellar employee. Um, actually received a patent during that time. Mm. And then all of a sudden this ban uh, mandate from President Biden came down and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good for the vaccine. I, Cause I, I didn't want to get vaccinated and I didn't get vaccinated. So that came to a head and there's actually verbiage in his mandate that specified me, a remote contractor working at home. So, oh. For that two years, I didn't go into my main building. We had this weird like quarantine thing to drop off equipment and laptops, but I was quarantined here hundred percent. And in this like one month period, when he made this mandate, I was thrown under the bus. All of a sudden my life flipped upside down and I was forced with my career or getting the vaccine. 
And if you know me, I'm pretty uh, uh, trying to find the right word here, but I, I wasn't going to get it. Um, so I fought. I actually hired an attorney and tried to fight this for probably two months. And I quickly learned that I had no rights as an unvaccinated person. You know, if it had something to do with my skin color, or my sex or something, I would have a legal case. But I had no feet to stand on. And so it came to a head and I was terminated from my position. I mean, at the end of the day, I decided to sign a severance agreement instead of having a termination on my records so I could have a better foot in the door in the future. But I was essentially forced out of the company, me and this pregnant woman. So there is another pregnant woman that stood at her feet with me and was like, I'm not going to get vaccinated because I don't know what it's going to do to my unborn child. She got kicked out with me. So this is how terrible it was. It just flipped my life upside down. Um, but I had other financial means. So I decided I wanted to stay home and raise my two little kids. I, at the time, my kids were one and three. And so I was like, I'm going to be a stay at home dad. I'll look for some engineering remote contractor work and kind of continue on after I take some time off. So a couple of years went by. This was in or one year went by. This is in 2021. And ironically, I was terminated on November 5th. That's a pretty interesting date because if you watch like V for Vendetta, that's the day when everything happens. So it's just ironic, like November 5th, I lost my job. Like my career was over. Um, and that mandate from Biden, I believe, was shot down from Congress because it was unconstitutional. So I essentially got sucked up in this like st stupid policy in like a two month window. And I was like, oh, and it wasn't because of my performance or anything, because I was pretty good at what I did. I actually loved what I did. Anyway, so I was a stay at home dad for a while and we would take a, probably like two or three road trips a year. We have a camper go out camping. And during that time, let me rewind back in about 2013, I fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole hard. Um, so I think there's two rabbit holes and it took me till about, I was always health oriented with my food and stuff, but it was about the time COVID came around. I really fell down the, this health rabbit hole because it just opened my eyes to what was going on. I saw all these terrible decisions being made. And so I essentially fell down the, the health rabbit hole at the same time or not the same time, but after I fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I was just thinking, how can I fuse these two together? And it wasn't until we were going gas station to gas station to grocery store to grocery store. Because if you've had kids, you know, they're sitting in the back seat going, I want treats. I want this. I want that. I'm hungry. Okay, here's some like yummy, good food I made you. No, I don't want that. So we would go to the gas station. There'd be I wouldn't buy anything because everything was like, you know how it is it's laced with seed oils that has additives soy products it's all corn based it's just you know red five yellow five all this junk it's all industrial sludged mixed up in a different way and we were really let down from this one time and i remember my wife coming home and she bought this book and inside this book there's a recipe for pemmican and i kind of dismissed it at first and a few months later i thought about it and i was like i'm gonna make some and so we started making it and we liked it. We made it for the kids. The kids would eat only certain types of it. Um, they wouldn't eat like traditional pemmican. And we let a few other people sample it. And this was kind of like a snack we made on the on our road trips. And after we let a few other people try it, we got inspired by what people thought of it. And we said, you know what? Let's fuse our passion for Bitcoin and let's fuse our passion for health and let's make pemmican great again let's build a pemmican bar that has a few other additives to make it taste great because traditional pemmican is is essentially beef tallow and beef dried beef you pulverize it you pack it in the natives would pack it into like a leather sack and you know i would eat it but i i would eat it to survive and if i was like hungry but it's not something that many people you know there's always outliers who love it many people wouldn't necessarily enjoy it. So we were kind of thinking about those people who eat a lot of Cliff Bars. How can we make it taste better? And so we kind of invented the Alpha Bar after many iterations to be what it is today. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Wow, I mean, that's some story. Yeah. I, mean, I, remember, I remember those days of 
your 2020 and 2021, it, it, it seemed like a century ago. Um, I remember how draconian it got in Illinois. We didn't vaccinate the kids. And, um, you know, you couldn't go to restaurants and movie theaters. And it was, it was, I never, I never seen anything like that in my life where, uh, you know, it was like wearing a scarlet letter uh, in town or you felt like one, you know, and like you were wearing one. And, and just the way things were, people were labeled publicly. It's just uh, really uh, abhorrent. Uh, oh, I don't yeah. know if it's all gone away. Um, I felt it pretty hard there. I, I remember, you know, because here's kind of the unfair thing that went on at my company. They they asked us all to get the vaccine, and probably twenty five percent of the people didn't send in their vaccine card via email. So they did a lottery, and they said, once we get to ninety percent vaccination rate, we're going to give five people a thousand dollars. And so that put the pressure up. The vaccination rate at my place went to ninety five percent. Then they said, when we get to 100%, we're going to give out five prizes for like $5,000. And so here, just a handful of people, like myself and a couple of others, are now being pressured because we're stopping people from winning this $20,000 purse. And it's completely unfair. I remember being called an anti-vaxxer, and I had never even thought about that. So up to that point, I wasn't an anti-vaxxer. I was just questioning the COVID vaccine. That's all I was doing. I'm fully vaccinated from childhood. And up till then, we had our kids more or less fully vaccinated. I was still pretty picky about that. But yeah, I remember walking in with a piece of hardware, exchanging it with the people in the building who did the gear. And they came out fully masked and in a suit. And I was like, what's up? And the guy was like, your viral load is too high. And I'm like, oh my God, what does that even mean? So it was just completely ridiculous i'm sure we all had some ridiculous story like that but that comment i'll never forget that comment i was treated like a leper like i had just virus shooting out of my body or something right oh my god there's just so much terrible stuff there um i remember with uh my kids my, my little girl was in kindergarten and they were testing the students and if someone tested positive they wanted to they wanted to put her in a um it's uh, like a isolation room and until, you know, a parent could come and, and get your kid, you know, and the idea of someone putting a five, my five-year-old in an isolation chamber, especially considering they didn't have room for like a gymnasium or cafeteria. They're running out of space for other facilities. They're dedicating space to this was, I mean, I pulled her out of school. I was like, I can't send her to this institution anymore. If that's the way you prioritize uh, learning or, or right. the environment, um, atrocious. And, and you know, you could see it in, and you hear it in the branding of Alpa. Um, you know, we don't run with the crowd. We question the man. We believe in freedom. I mean, it's great. Uh, it speaks volumes. Tell me more about. I don't even know how to say this. Pimmican. Um, Pimmican. Yeah. So. Uh, this is just tell me a little bit more, maybe round it out a bit. It's uh, how old of a tradition is this? And um, right. So before I get started, if you want to know a lot about it and are interested in it, you can read the book, not by bread alone. It's an excellent book. Um, but essentially pemmican, I don't know how far it goes back. I know it from when the natives were here in North America. So it comes from them. When the bison were prolific here, they would traditionally make it from bison and they would air dry this meat in these like smoke sheds. I think some of it was smoke, some of it was just air dried. And they would pulverize it with like a mortar and pestle and they would just take it. And so they take suet, which is the fat from the animal, and they would render it down into tallow. Um, or they would just use suet too, depending on the quality of it and whatever. They would take little... Uh, not even little, sometimes little, sometimes big. They take leather bags and they would just pack it in with some tool. They'd, they would take the pulverized uh, bison and they'd pack it in with suet, bison suet, bison suet, and they would just pack it into these leather bags. And this stuff lasted, if done, bar, if done right and stored properly, it would last for decades. And they would survive off it. Um, early explorers, like European explorers, came over to north america and 
a lot of them relied on it. So these burly men would be out hoofing it with just a bag of pemmican and they would survive for years on it. And that's all they would eat. And pemmican got to be a pretty big deal. People would like crave it. And then sooner or later, there'd, there'd be these companies selling pemmican. And I believe it was the Hudson, Hudson Bay Company who got in the pemmican war. I can't remember who they fought, but there's a big war that occurred. And it was it's hilarious because in the book, they describe this war and the men would get, grab big, like hundred pound bags of pemmican and stack them up in front of their base as, as a shield. So these big bag of bag of pemmican, they're dense. Um, so it essentially is the most possible dense food you can create. There's no other food that's higher, has a higher nutritional density than pemmican. And that's why it stood the test of time. And that's why it was so important back then, but you know, our modern, modern food system kind of pushed that out and destroyed our taste buds. And here we are. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, so what was it like starting a food company? How do you even kind of get your head around that? And what was that journey like? It was exciting. Um, funny thing is, is when I started my life as an employee, when I was like 14 years old, I worked in the kitchen. And so I always joke with my mom. I'm like, hey, look, I started in a kitchen and I made all the way to the top as, you know, junior, senior level engineer at one of the best defense contractors. And now I'm in the kitchen again, happily. Um, it's been great. We started Alpa in our kitchen, quickly moved to renting a pretty like entry level commercial kitchen down here in Longmont. And we quickly realized that we were much our sanitary level and our hygiene level and just our cleanliness and organization was off the charts compared to the people who we were in the kitchen with. And we we're like, we got to get out of here. So we scrambled around, looked for kitchens and they're just so expensive to rent. We decided to convert our garage into a commercial USDA kitchen. So we have a pretty large property here and we were able to spare our garage because we have other structures and we converted that, that garage into a, really nice commercial kitchen uh just my wife and i and my dad came and helped um the usda has been over and checked it out and it's we're waiting for this official usda certification but yeah i think it's great um i get we get to work our own schedules we get to prioritize our kids and we get to go in there and we get to go collect re regenerative beef from awesome ranchers and shake their hands we get to spread the word about bitcoin and have a lot of NPC people look at us like we're crazy. Like what's this weird meat bar thing you're selling? Like, why aren't you eating Snickers? Um, it's fun all around. I really like it. Yeah, I'm going to run and close this door real quick. I'm freezing. Sure. No problem. I think we're uh, battling different elements these days. Right. Uh, it's hot when I walked in here and now I'm cold. Yeah, no, I we're, we're a little warmer here in, in Florida. Well, absolutely. So cold is a little, a little different uh, for us. <laughs> Um, it was actually like 65 today. Uh, yeah, that was about that was about where we were. Nice. Maybe, maybe maybe in the morning. Uh, 70 for tops, I guess. But uh, we get down a little bit in the 40s sometimes, but uh, which is our brutal winter. Right. Um, so where where does the name come from? Alpa. So the name, right. The name's quite important to us. Um, so I am I'm a Basque person. Uh, my mother is 100% Basque, and my grandmother and grandfather immigrated here when they were young. So Alpa is a word that goes back to, as far as I can remember, that means kind of like the little kids in the family are running around screaming, Alpa, Alpa, that means pick me up. Like, I want picked up and I want held. So Alpa means like, pick me up. And so when we had little kids, our little kids picked that up and they ran with it and they're always yelling Alpa at us. And we just thought that would be a really good name for the bar. Nice. I love it. And and what are some of the ingredients? And and let's start with the regenerative beef. And so when you're running around getting re regenerative beef from, you know, small local ranchers, what cuts are you getting? What part of the cow or parts, right, so, I should say, maybe? Right. Yeah. So we experimented in the beginning a lot with different cuts. Um, what it really comes down to is how much fat content is in that cut. And so we start with, we do a, 
about a 50 50 mix of roasts and then we do another 50 50 mix of uh, a ground mix which is parts from many different parts of the animal but the fat content we try to nail it like 90 percent or something or sorry 10 percent, 90 percent beef um, but what you find when you do this, when you're going to small ranches and you're sourcing beef from these small operations, is that one time you might go buy beef and it might be a really lean bowl and you buy a lot of that beef. And then a month later, you go buy a different cow and the fat content's higher. And so one of the biggest challenges of Alpa is bringing all this beef in and then winding up with a consistent bar. And then what we realized is while we can pretty much nail the consistency. There's a little variation between batches. The problem is we've been programmed as consumers to think that you buy the same exact product for years on end. You know, the orange juice always tastes the exact same. It's homogenous, it's it's all mixed together and it's this bland, or it's not bland, but it's the same thing. And that's what we expect. And that's not how natural foods work. Um, and that's what we like about it. So our, our batch to batch varies just slightly. Sometimes it'll be a slightly softer, just a little different. And I think that really shows that we're actually, it proves pretty much that we're getting uh, smaller inputs from smaller sources and we're not mixing them all together. Yeah. Well, I love that. And so uh, that's the beef, you know, it says no, you know, uh, alpha bars are loaded with real food, but no fillers, no binders, mm -hmm. no preservatives, no natural flavors, no artificial flavors, no soy, corn, or wheat, no industrial sludge anywhere. It's like, where's the food? Uh, I mean, if you think about the real, you know, the, the fiat world, they'd be like, there's yeah. nothing left. There's nothing there. <laughs> so what else goes in besides beef? All right. So our, our base formulation is the apex bar is beef, tallow, butter, honey. So, and we use a kind of a special kind of flash dried freeze butter. It's a, it's a powderized butter. It's all hundred percent grass fed and finished butter. It's really high quality stuff, but you can't just use like soft butter. It's a lot more difficult to do that but yeah our base formulation is four ingredients beef tallow butter honey um and we added we added so traditional pemmican is just essentially bison or beef and tallow just two ingredients sometimes they used cranberries and other things but we decided that since we're not necessarily going after that like cream of the crop pure carnivore crowd there's other there's a couple other businesses that do that we are kind of going after the larger crowd who maybe needs to get away from cliff bars. I call them the imperfect carnivores. They're, you know, they're, they're not like purists. Um, and so to bump that flavor profile up and make it more palatable, the butter and the honey really knock it out of the park and make it a product that we're happy to sell. And a lot of people love. Yeah, sure. And then why uh, blueberries, almonds, cranberries, pecans? I, I mean, I guess they go together well, but um, I mean, there's maybe some other things that you didn't choose to go with. Um, how'd you come across these and, and these flavor profiles? And, and I mean, they're great, but you know, how'd you come up? So we decided to add nuts and berries. So our kids would like them more and then that works. Our kids probably rarely will ever touch like an apex bar, but they'll eat a blueberry almond or a cranberry pecan. And we chose blueberries and cranberries and almonds and pecans because they can be sourced locally here from a couple of mm. small farms in Oregon. Like we can't really source those from Colorado. I wish we could but they are USA sourced and they're some small farms pretty much in Oregon. And I do like to kind of brag about our cranberries we get, because if you've ever looked for dehydrated cranberries or um, it's like a snack, you will not find them without sunflower oil. They will have sunflower oil on them like 99% of the time. So we looked long and hard and we finally sourced cranberries that don't have sunflower oil. So we can truly say they're not, there's no seed oil or sunflower oil in our product. Now, blueberries are easy to get that way. Yeah, it seems it's like all the jerky has uh, seed oils in it as well. Oh, yeah. Most of the jerkies have hydrolyzed soy protein, corn, yep. uh, nitrates, other preservatives. You name it. It's just like the ingredient list is, if your ingredient list is like that long, it's got industrial sludge. So how much uh, is this of this is food science? Uh, how much are we, uh, you know, I don't say this in a negative way, but how much are we engineering the, the food? Like how does water and moisture play into this? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so it plays a, a major component. Like this is one of the biggest parts of our product. And I, I love it because I'm an engineer and a scientist first. So there's something called 
every food product has kind of two water metrics. There's water content and there's water activity. So the water content is pretty obvious. It's the amount of water in something. The water activity is the, the, the willingness of the water molecules to bind to chemicals and, and microbes and other living organisms. So the water activity is a value normalized between zero and one. One is just a pure cup of water. Zero is no water at all. So if you were ranging, so if you go buy like tomatoes or like a piece of beef, your water activity is probably 0.95 or higher. So it's, you know, the water activity, it has a lot of water molecules that are actively ready to have microbes come down on it and possibly bind with other chemicals. This, this, these water molecules are free to interact. And when you have that, you have spoilage, right? So a lot of like our perishable foods have really high water activities. The reason why pemmican is so amazing is because you essentially suck most of that water out of the beef and tallow is essentially uh, waterless. I mean, there's some water in it, but it's very low. So you essentially pull all that water activity that uh, those free water molecules out and you replace it with fat. And when you do that, you get a product that microbes literally cannot interact with. You don't have any molds or funguses or any kind of E. coli, salmonella, any kind of microbes binding to that. And so, and that happens when you get under a water activity of about 0.65. And we target every bar under 0.6. And we've never had a batch go out that's above 0.6. So when you hit 0.6 or below, you're pretty much guaranteed to not have any microbial growth as long as the storage conditions, you know, aren't like a humid environment because a water activities can normalize to each other. So if you take a bar that has a water activity of 0.6 and you stick it in a really humid, warm place, well, those free water molecules from the environment will bind into the food and create a higher water activity, thus inviting microbes and all sorts of other things. So that's why you need like a package and to store it, you know, pretty moderately. It's a pretty big range of storage. Um, but yeah, that's one big investment we had to make as a company. We had to purchase a quite expensive meter. So we batch test every every batch that goes out and get a sample of it and document that. And that's going to, that's part of the USDA process. We have to show that because if we are higher than that, we would have to start adding industrial sludge. Now there is another caveat to that. Now things can still go rancid, but rancicity does not mean microbes. You can eat rancid food. It just has a bad taste. It essentially means it's oxidized. So, you know, I, I said earlier that traditional pemmican can last decades and right now, our bars cannot last decades because of the butter. The butter will bind with uh, oxygen and essentially make it rancid. We don't have a specific date for that yet, but we've seen it over like six months. If you leave them out on the shelf, you might get a little bit of that. But like, just to reiterate, that is not going to harm you. It's just modifies a flavor profile. You can eat rancid food, but yeah. So it's, it's very scientific in nature to hit it right. Yeah, no, it's, it sounds incredibly, uh, act, you know, sort of uh, scientific in terms of what you have to hit. And I never really thought about uh, water content or water activity. I don't even think I I've... never, I never did either. And it blew my mind when I learned about it and I kind of dove right into it. And, and so we actually measure the water activity of all the inputs to the bar just to know, to be, to be sure that our, out, our output bar, our final bar will have a low water activity. Because if we get some blueberries that weren't properly dried and their water activity is like 0.9 or something or something ridiculous and we bind it into our bar, that won't be good. So we actually test the inputs of our bar before we add them in there to ensure we get a, a net water activity. Right. So Hold now we've talked, we, we've talked a, a bit about the inputs and thinking about the bar as the output, but you know, measuring the output of the bar, uh, how does it achieve such high energy density and, and resulted a pick me up uh, what's in the bar in terms of fat calories carbs protein yeah the, i mean our our apex bar is like 327 calories um i forget the other numbers off the top of my head but the, the reason it's so dense is because fat has a lot of calories and 27 grams of fat 
27 grams six of fat, carbs nine, and six uh, carbs and 14 grams of protein, 14 grams of protein. Right. Yeah. And when you go to the, the berries and nuts, you'll see a little decrease because those berries and nuts are less calorie dense than that, mm. that beef and fat that we had to replace it with. But yeah, beef and fat are incredibly calorie dense and fat dense. And that's what gives you that large calorie load. Right. And how do you manage packaging and shipping? Right. So the packaging you see now was never intended to last this long. Um, we're kind of having a, essentially we're in limbo with the USDA and it's not just the USDA certification, it's the USD grant we're kind of waiting on. And so we expected to be done with that packaging. That's kind of generation one packaging, um, the tin foil wrapped at that cardboard sleeve. So we will be updating that packaging hopefully soon. Um, to something that's a little there's a few issues with it i mean but it works as it, it works now but yeah we'll be updating it to hopefully a fully sealed package and something that is more conducive to a mechanized uh, process the process we use now is all by hand and now that we're a little more educated in packaging we look at a machine that can wrap tin foil like that and it's incredibly complicated and so we're actually currently designing a different packaging and how would you describe where where are you in Colorado? How would you describe the area? So we're in the Front Range, uh, Front Range of the Rocky Mountains. You probably know where Den or Denver is, and then Boulder is kind of closer to the Front Range. There, just nested right in front of the mountains. We are just fifteen minutes north of Boulder, and so from my backyard, we have the view of the Rocky Mountains. I actually moved to Boulder when I started, and I I left because we wanted a larger piece of property and it, you know, by the time I was ready to do it, it they're like $3 million for the property we wanted. So we moved up into Longmont and well, we nice. make all of our bars on our property. Now it's pretty awesome. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, do you consider yourself a prepper? Absolutely. I've always had that kind of mindset. Um, I'm not necessarily like a negative doomsdayer, but I've always had, I always think it's because I grew up in a neighborhood with a bunch of Mormons. And I remember going over and like to my Mormons friends and looking in their basement and be like, wow, you guys have like a water tank and a bunch of canned foods. And I just remember that from a childhood. And I don't know if that's the reason I am like I am, but oh yeah, I have, you know, probably a million calories for my family to eat here and all the equipment. And if you ever came to our house or looked at our house from Google maps, you'll be like, wow, this place is like, pretty much a homestead stuck in the middle of Longmont, stuck in the middle of Longmont. Um, we grow as much food as we can. We have like 25 chickens. We're about to get two sheep. We have quail. Um, yeah. What I'd do you do? Yes. For, what do you do for water? So water, drinking we do water. have, we have city water for drinking water. We also have an old well that I've re reconditioned and it, it works, but it is drinkable. It's a very hard water. Um, we have two forms of water ice. We have, um, the Pennock lateral that is right in front of our property that we can pull out and get a lot of water. So we use that water to water all of our property. Um, we only use city water in a house. And then we actually have a ditch in the back of our yard that we can call up some guy and be like, Hey, send three yards of water down. And then it comes and floods the back. And the way I designed our irrigation system is I don't really ever call for that flooded water. We don't really do flood irrigation. I have a lift pump that I pull out in the front yard and it goes through miles of piping and we have like 20 irrigation zones and tons of garden beds. My wife is very into plants and herbs and growing stuff. And so she does all that. I'm the guy that builds stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out water at home. We have a, you know, filter installed on the faucet, but that's apparently not good enough. We're trying to figure out, you know, home delivery and, spring or mineral or purified with minerals added back uh so, it seems so in terms of drinking the water we don't drink yeah. the city water i've probably used a berkey system for eight years now and i also have a reverse osmosis system in this office here that we use pretty often so yeah i don't yeah this is kids... what i'm getting at right so this is right your... yeah so that's a, that's a big piece so in terms of like putting into my body I like to have something else be the filter before my body's a filter. So yeah, I, I've probably been using a Berkey for, let's say like seven or eight years. So my kids have grown up their whole lives drinking water out of either the Berkey or the reverse, reverse osmosis system. 
Right. Even, even though I have tested our water here and it is pretty good, you know, the tests don't cover everything. There's a lot of things who knows what's in it. So I just practice the precautionary principle and I'm, I'm a filtered water guy. And what are you doing for power? Um, do you have a so, generator or are you looking to use like as a backup? Do you, or do you have solar or wind options? Right. So that's one thing that's really cramping my style here is I want to be fully off grid. Um, and we are looking at this property probably from a shorter time span and we're going to get out and go somewhere bigger away from the city probably in a, I don't know, under five years. So that's our plan. And right now we have city power. I have about 2000 watts of solar panels that directly offset our use during the day. Um, I do have an emergency generator that I can power up in the event of a grid down. And we're kind of nerdy like this. And about every six months I go to the breaker. I'm like, all right, guys, break her off. And then I shut the water off too. And we kind of do like this silly, like dry run, just it's fun. And power up the generator. I modified our main electrical panel so I can just plug in a 30 amp uh, generator and it powers the whole property. Um, this shed, actually, if you look in this little white closet behind me, I have a 150 gallon water tank that can backfeed everywhere in our property and supply water if the grid went down. Um, this building I'm in is isolated from our main house. So I plumbed everything in a way that I can flip a series of four or five valves and I can backfeed from a battery powered pump and pressurize everything, showers, faucets, everything. And then we can uh, put to fill up the tank, we can go from our well. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely have a prepper mindset. <laughs> what advice would you give to people? In terms of doing what I'm doing? Or just additional things maybe that I haven't thought of just now, but what other I steps? I mean, I, I mean, you just, you know, I asked you about water. You're like, I'm getting water from the city. And I'm like, well, you know, spring or mineral. And you're like, well, you know, I'm, <laughs> these are the 19 steps right. I've taken. And I rebuilt right. this whole structure. And uh, I'm going to flip these 17 valves. And, uh, you know, I'm going to steal water from the 17. I mean, I'm just making that up. But, like, it seems to go a little bit further than I thought. Right, yeah. My advice to people would be, what are you going to do if there's no running water? There's no electricity and with no electricity comes a lot of other things. My advice would be to have, depending on your situation, your family, like have enough food, get into like uh, rotating a food supply. Don't just have enough food that lasts you a few days, have a stack of cash on hand in case something happens. Just think about these basic prepping skills. And I know there's a lot of people who aren't as uh, skilled as I am in like building stuff, I can, I can build pretty much anything, but there's a lot of things you can buy. And if you don't have the money, there's a lot of things you can read about and just beef up your skills. I mean, even if you don't know anything, go, go buy a, like a small medical handbook and learn how to like do some of your own medical stuff for like basic wound care or just any of those kind of things. It's just get out, start reading, learn, because a lot of people have this mindset that, oh, when the time comes, I'll have the information on hand and then I'll learn it there. And I don't think that will work. I think I think everyone should be sort of a prepper in a way. You don't have to be a doomsday prepper. I mean, you don't have to be live in fear, but you can just prep. I mean, that's what our ancestor did. And that's what's in our blood is to, to be sort of a prepper. Right. Uh, well, you know, maybe along the, and I like to think like a prepper. I don't know if I act enough like a prepper, uh, but maybe along those lines and with your background, uh, what is, you know, the, the concerns with 5G uh, and what is the difference in the tech behind 5G compared to maybe whatever the technology was before that? All right. So let's kind of talk about the difference between 4G and 5G, because we all kind of, grew up and we know what 4g is 4g is based upon a radiating antenna so you've you've seen the towers and they have these little panels up there and these panels essentially broadcast um you know there's many frequency that they operate at but it's in the 600 900 megahertz region they broadcast a a large wide pattern down to many people into this cell so cell towers are organized and arranged in these kind of honeycomb grids they're called cells and each tower serves a cell. So if you hop into a new cell, you beam down from a new antenna. 
And these antennas from 4G are, you know, there's maybe one or two antennas in the array with many arrays going omnidirectionally around it radially. And these antennas broadcast a big wide pattern. And <clears throat> they're down in that 600, 900, and possibly higher frequencies, depending. Um, so 5G comes in and it opens up that speed. You, you get way increased speed. The latency goes down. You can have many more users packed into the small grid. And the biggest difference is now they're using beamforming technology. So now these antennas have hundreds of mini antennas inside them on this panel. And these hundreds or maybe dozens to even hundreds of antennas act in unison to form beams. So you can adjust the phase on each of these little antennas and you can steer a pencil beam right at a user and they can actively track you as you're using a 5G system. So these are uh, continuously beam steered antennas with really high gain and increased power output. So that's kind of the difference. Oh, and another big difference is that the, the grid, the cells are now smaller because with the increased frequency and these higher data uh, rates, you have you can't go as far. So now you're gonna have uh, many more, the, the density of these access points are gonna be much denser. You need them every few blocks in a city to, to meet these like gigabit speeds per second. Um, so first of all, you have a much more densely packed uh, radiator system. And secondly, it's beam forming technology. And just to recap, the advantages you get are way more speed, way less latency, um, and many more devices can connect at the same time. Now, the concern with 5G is kind of the same concern with all EMFs. Um, and just to point out, light is an EMF. So people who are concerned about like blue light at night, that's an EMF. Um, essentially, the, the health guidelines that govern EMFs and our safety really haven't been updated since like the 90s. And since the 90s, antenna technology and the density that we're feeling the electromagnetic spectrum of has increased insanely. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum is packed. That goes all the way down from DC up to radio frequencies. And, you know, there's a lot in between there, but it's packed. The military uses it, it's packed. We use it all the time. And essentially the guidelines that tell you if it's safe or not are just outdated. And there's a lot of a lot of studies coming out showing that there's a lot of things to be concerned about, you know, primarily like oxidative stress on your body and all these things. But we're told that, oh, it's it's not it's non ionizing. So it's it's safe. So essentially ionizing radiation is what you hear about from like a nuclear bomb explosion like Hiroshima and um, Chernobyl. That type of radiation, you can see in or pretty quickly devastating effects on your body because it breaks your DNA apart. It's ionizing radiation. But we're told that once it crosses that chasm from ionizing to non-ionizing, that is totally safe. And that the only thing you have to worry about is this thermal effect. And it's so much more nuanced than that. And we're learning so much more about these things. And I have a very deep understanding of this. And while I'm not like immediately concerned, like I still use my Wi-Fi and stuff, or sorry, my cell phone, I don't have Wi-Fi anymore. And I have a hardwired ethernet everywhere. I don't want to have my kids growing up with these unknown effects of EMFs. I, I can't say directly that they're doing instantaneous damage, but I know that it's more akin to like smoking a cigarette. You're gonna see, uh, a lot of exposure over a long time is probably going to lead to some negative health, health outcomes that we're going to discover. I mean, there's a lot of data. If you're interested, go research Henry Lai. He has over 2,500 peer-reviewed studies showing oxidative stress, tumors in rats, um, infertility, degradation to your sperm, all sorts of things. So I, I think it's something to exercise caution with. I don't think it's something to freak out about and say we're going back to the cave days. Um, just this proliferation of wireless everywhere is probably not the best idea. I think there's a fine balance there. And I think, I think you just need to be aware about it and especially the children. So uh, children have a, a much higher water content than we do and they're much smaller. Um, and so they can absorb a lot more of these EMFs. And frankly, I'm not going to 
do something to my children that I don't know exactly the outcomes. I mean, we're seeing a rise in all sorts of things across the board. And the the culprit here is probably a multitude of things, right? It's it's our food, it's our lack of sunlight, it's it's EMFs, it's a bunch of different things. And so it's just something to be aware of and not just dismiss it like it's something that's not harmless or that is harmless. So are you saying the EMF, um, more of the potential harm and concern comes more from the 5G technology than the 4G technology, or it's always been a concern? It's always been a concern. It's always so been a concern. An EMF is an EMF. It's electromagnetic field. So 4G and 5G are both electromagnetic fields. They're just distorting the pattern out of the antenna differently. Um, so the, the disadvantage of 4G is that it's essentially blanket radiating everyone in the vicinity. There's very uh, very little beam steering these things do. They're, so for all practical purpose, they're just kind of blanketing out radiation. So like all over the place, you're, you're being swamped in it all the time right now. You can't avoid it really. 5G, the actually advantage of 5G is that if you're not an active user and you don't have like a 5G device on, well, you're more or less, that beam's not pointed at you. So you're sitting in a null of this antenna. But if you're a heavy user of 5G devices, you're going to have this beam blasting you the whole time. And it's just not something I want. Um, but yeah, it's it's with 4G, 3G. These EMFs come from light bulbs. They come from any kind of switch mode power supply. Anything that has like electronics in it that turn on and off create EMFs. And we, you have EMFs going through your outlets. Your the power coming into your house is sixty hertz power, and so EMFs have been around for a long time. But we're just told there's nothing to worry about, and I, I frankly don't agree with that. So you're saying uh, one way to reduce your exposure to this technology is to uh, reduce your wireless uh, capabilities, not use right. wireless so in the home. The first thing you can do is just address your media EMF environment. Like if you have kids and there's like a wireless nanny cam and a, a baby monitor and like Bluetooth devices, I get that stuff out. So your body is able to do a lot of things during sleep. So you're, if, you, if you're concerned about this, your first step is to kind of address this immediate EMF environment. Like do you have a Wi-Fi router that just sits next to you all day long? If so, maybe turn it off at night. If you move that router 15 feet away from you, that's a massive reduction in field strength because electromagnetic fields decay by the distance squared. So they they fall off in field strength rapidly. So um, so don't don't talk with your phone right on your face like this. It's just not good. I mean, you can go into iPhone settings and right and under RF exposure, you can see there's guidelines. You're supposed to be wearing a headset or some wired headset, not putting it right up to your head. You want a distance. I think they recommend like an inch or something. So this is even legally spelled out in the terms of service. Like you're, they are not tested in terms and, and meet health and safety guidelines when they're right up to your head. Or like you see women place them in their bras right here or dudes when they're driving, they'll stick their phone right under their nuts and just drive away. Um, it's just things like that. I mean, one time, I'm not going to do anything to you. I mean, a long time, we don't know. I, I think there's a lot of data out there that merits being concerned about it. So yeah, what I did is I I ditched Wi-Fi. I, I kind of thought about it for a while and I was like, I don't need Wi-Fi. I liberate myself from a lot of these devices. I, I hardwire my phone when I use it most of the time. I have a little USB to Ethernet dongle. I just plug in. I, I looked at the two spots I sit on my phone most. It's in my bed, it's on my couch. And so I wired an Ethernet to my couch and my bed and I just have a USB-C port and I just plug it in and it's instantly connected. I leave my phone in airplane mode almost all the time, but I'll use it every now and then. It's not like I'm going back to the cave days. Uh, there's a, I think there's a good balance here. And like I said about your router, like get that thing away from you at night. Maybe get a timer switch that shuts off every night. And you know, your body can deal with a lot of this oxidative stress while sleeping. And if you don't give your body that time to rebuild itself during sleep and you're just continuously getting bombarded, you know, you might wind up with some of these like metabolic things and health problems that we don't really know where they're originating from. Wow. And so like even like these, what are these, these ear pods, whatever, these are bad for you with the, 
direct into your brain kind of thing. I, I hate to say the word bad for you because I just think we should exercise precaution with them, but I, Right. I don't want to put those on my head. I, I like, I run a lot. And when those first came out, I was like, man, that's an awesome invention because I hate the wire bouncing all over me, but I don't want to stick on my head. But honestly, if you're putting them in for a 30 minute workout or something, you're, it's probably not the biggest deal, but if you're having them in your head all day for weeks on end, I wouldn't do it. Right. Do I, you I think, mean, coming I mean, from an RF engineer who's designed the stuff for 15 years, I'm, I'm not going to put it in my head. I'm going to lean towards these things are probably bad for us long term. Yeah, And I would say that. do you think, uh, but at the beginning of sort of like our dive into 5G, you know, you mentioned a lot of the benefits. And I, I really wonder how much of, This conversation we're having is is driven by we like the benefits and we don't care or concern ourselves or know about uh you know Right. concerns or you know we know about these concerns and uh we like them or you know hey we're gonna make money selling this technology out the front door and we'll sell the health care out the back door uh Right. you know vanguard and blackrock own all those both sides of those uh, industries. I mean, is, is it more nefarious, do you think? I think a lot of things don't start nefarious, but at this point it's it's such a massive pillar of what props up our world that it's hard to get rid of it. I mean, and the things that provide you such convenience are hard to put down, especially when you don't, it doesn't a, a cause immediate like distress. It's not like you put a, your wireless earbuds in and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I can feel that. So, I mean, some people are hypersensitive. I'm not, I, I, I can't say I'm hypersensitive. Um, but And I think a lot of the data is probably being squashed from the big companies. I mean, just like the vaccine, it's very eerily similar, or it's very eerily similar to when we learned about when cigarettes caused uh, cancer. You know, the industry was saying no, 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 and they fought it, but the science in the end won, and here they are. We know that cigarettes cause cancer. I think we'll find something like that out in the future. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. Yeah, and then, then you read reports so like where maybe nicotine helps people maintain their weight and maybe there are other benefits and Right, maybe but it's the nicotine. the other things. So if you look at a cigarette, I don't smoke there, nicotine, but I don't either, but I, I have an aunt who is a respiratory clinologist. She told me that if I was ever to smoke cigarettes, which I don't, she go, I could just get an American spirit because it's just That's organic what I've heard tobacco. too. Like as long as it's more organic, and And I I heard I... even maybe. Not American spirit, but maybe something, you know, that you can only get in Europe, but like real tobacco with no Real additives tobacco. is a very As, different thing. right. As far as I know, someone might say I'm wrong here, but I don't think the Yeah, nicotine I mean, causes cancer. I think it's the the other 400, stuff in there. 400 plus chemicals they spray on those cigarettes Right. to make you addicted that causes cancer. Right. And, and you, you know, so... I mean, we won't ever have the answers, but if it's like, if all this is nefarious, you know, it's like, we're going to take nicotine and, and somehow we'll take tobacco and make it bad for you. Uh, we're going to make the food bad for you. Uh, we're going to make the technology bad for you. All of it. Are all the purveyors somehow insulated from this, them and their children? Like, you know, I, I mean, I've heard stories, you know, where like, you know, the, uh, the savants out of Silicon Valley don't let their kids near technology and all this stuff. And, I can get that, you know, but like, are they, you know, leading, living these wireless uh, lives with, uh, you know what I'm saying, where they're insulated from all these concerns that us normies have. I don't even mean concerns, but all these things that were just, we're dealt this, this terrible hand and somehow they were just not dealing with all this bad stuff. Yeah, I, my gut tells me that it's mostly not nefarious when it all starts. Um, and I think it gets to a point where it's you're sucking every last penny out of something and you're just optimizing it. And you, it's just the fiat way. And you just pull every penny out of it and you wind up with garbage. Um, and then you have opportunists come in and they, they're making profit on it. And, you know, they're sitting up there earning from it. And I, I think a lot of it winds up like that and then turns nefarious. Um, but, yeah, I don't. I don't know about, you know, the 
the heads of like the FCC and all that, if they're sitting there with a wired house or if they're still using Wi-Fi or not. But, you know, I've heard the same things about the tech entrepreneurs. They don't let their kids have social media or phones and stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my foot down on that. I, I said that about sugar when my kids were born and I was like, I'm never going to give them sugar. And then it's almost impossible. You give them treats sometimes. Yeah. And I'm, and I say that about social media too, but I'm going to do my best. Like I just installed. Yeah, and you have to negotiate with your spouse over all these issues. Um, right. The good thing is my know, spouse. I mean that in the best possible way. I mean, yeah, I right. love, you know, I mean, I love, there's no one I want to negotiate and compromise with more than my wife. Uh, and most of the time we're always on the same page, but you know, there's just so many issues and so many, uh, so many. things life throws at you. So it, and, I think at the end of the day, you can just look at EMFs as another pervasive environmental toxin, just like this myriad of other things. And it's, it's really bad news because it's like, oh, great. Another thing. It's like, we have to worry about this, these things all day, every day. They, you just name it and there's some toxin. Yeah. I really battle with the kids and devices and things of that nature. And, uh, I kind of, I, I, I kind of leaned into just letting them uh, go where they were interested and kind of less rules and live in a yes house. And uh, there's some things I'm not the most proud of, but one, you know, it's like even my son, I mean, like he went to the video games very early and that turned into him wanting to code and create his own video games. Yeah, that's cool. You know, and this, so there's pros and cons to these things. And, right. Just limiting you know, things off the bat. It probably is not yeah. the best approach. It's probably um, education. And grandma wanted to get him a phone. He's super young. And I was kind of holding out on that. And, uh, you know, he got the phone. He's kind of obsessed with it now. And, you know, I know I'm a bad example because I, I look at the phone as like an extension of my brain, like mm -hmm. just not embedded in my body yet. I, it helps me think. It helps me retain information, find information. Uh, I don't have to write down directions anymore. Uh, just things of that. And, you know, so uh, I feel like stupid without my phone. And, right. uh, you know, he was like, well, you know, you always have your phone. And I said, you know, you, you don't have to take the bad parts of me and emulate them <laughs> yeah, exactly. and try to be but me. You're his you know? role model at the end of the day. So, yeah, but I'm like, try to just take my strengths, not my weaknesses and be 2.0 version of me or even 10.0. Um, you know, uh, don't trust verify even with your old man, like. Exactly. You know, I mean, I got uh, that shirt on right now. Yeah, no one's perfect, you know. Oh, I love that shirt. I love their hat. That's coin kite. I love the hat, the honey badger yeah. one. Yeah. I have it right behind me. Um, yeah, it's a it's a tough thing. I mean, you're much further along in fatherhood than I am. My oldest now is five, and yeah, I I'm not gonna. I'm a I'm a yes person compared to my wife. My wife's more hardcore about these things. Um, but at the mm. same time, we're doing things that we're telling them not to do. You know. Like sometimes yeah. I try to do like Twitter stuff in the morning. I get up at like five and I'm on the computer till like seven and my girl will like sneak up behind me and I'm scrolling through like some stupid bullshit on Twitter, like things I don't want her to see. And she's like, what's that daddy? And it, she wants to see it. And I'm like, well, don't look at that. Let's go look at this other thing. You know, the funny thing is I'll flip them over to the BC pay server page. And like my three-year-old boy knows when I need to rebalance lightning channels. He like looks at my channels. He's like, that one has too little, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing. And like I said, it's, it's a lot about balancing these things. It's, it's not about completely getting rid of them because look at where our lives are now with these technologies, they've advanced us a lot. And at the same time, they've kind of poisoned us. So it's, it's a balance and, you know, I'm not about to give away, throw away my cell phone. I still have a cell phone and I, when I'm out and about and I need to use it, I'll, I'll click on the LTE and I'll use it. But it's all about that that time and duration. I think it's just yeah. a good idea to minimize it. And what I found when, I, when I'm at home and I'm hardwiring into my phone, which sounds ridiculous, but I find I don't sit there as much and look up stuff I wouldn't otherwise. I'm, I'm more precise and targeted about how I use my phone. Um, yeah, it's been a net positive to us. Yeah, I mean, it's a drug. Uh, we it try is. to create a yes house for the kids. So what that means, though, is like we try to say yes to everything that they want to do in terms of what they see. But we we try not to have things in the house that we don't want that we don't. We don't I don't want to say yes to. Right. We just don't have it in the house, you know. Um, right. What I want to touch on now is though just a little bit more about your Bitcoin rabbit hole story. So you you briefly mentioned you found Bitcoin in 2013. 
Um, that's like a little over 10 years ago now, or, you know, depending oh, yeah. on the calendar and when you found it in 2013, I guess. But what was that journey like? Um, <laughs> you know, how'd you come? It was home? almost like, it was almost like when I found it, it was something I was envisioning. I, I was looking for Bitcoin before it found me. Um, so let's start with 2008. 2008 came along in the financial crisis and I was still like in college. I didn't have any money, so I didn't care at all. I had no connection to it. I didn't, I had nothing to lose. So usually when you don't have anything to lose like that and no a skin of the game, I didn't really put much thought into it. So I, I got done with college. I finished my master's degree. I was like $50,000 in debt. I got a pretty good paying job as an electrical engineer here. And I was also in a Dave Ramsey, funny, funny enough. And what I learned from Dave Ramsey is, you know, drive my 96 Jeep Cherokee and pay off my loans. Suck those loans down. Even though you're getting a good salary, don't go buy a brand new car. Like almost every other one of my colleagues or my uh, other employees at my engineering work, they would just spend their money and like pay the minimums. And I'm like, no, that's not my style. This is not what I learned from my mom and dad. This is not what I learned from Dave Ramsey. And I want to get out of these this loan. And so kind of at the same time, I, I really saw into the dollar and I just realized what this system was and how it's kind of the biggest scam that's ever been orchestrated on this planet. And I learned about the Federal Reserve. I learned um, one of the big awakening points for me was uh, the hidden secrets of money. I can't remember the guy. He's a big gold guy. It's the hidden secrets of money. And there's like six series on YouTube. If you say his name, I'll instantly remember it. Anyways, that series just opened me up to what this money system is. And honestly, I've been anti-authoritative my whole life. I don't really, when someone tells me what to do, it's like, okay, I'm not going to do that now. Um, and that's why when I get pulled over by a police officer, I'll get a ticket hands down because I just can't help but to be uh, kind of an asshole, I guess. <laughs> um, but anyways, during that time, I started getting really into silver and gold. And more in the silver because I was looking at this like historical ratio of being like, man, if I get silver, I will, once that gold and silver ratio closes, I'm going to flip it into gold and I'm going to be set. I don't want to hold on to these dollars. So I'd buy, I found this guy on Craigslist who's this 60 year old priest from Denver. He's hilarious. He would drive in and meet me in this van. He had like seriously like a million dollars worth of silver in the back. And he told me, God put him on this earth to buy coins from the treasury with his name and then sell them to people without collecting their names. And I was like, how did this guy come in my life? Um, I won't say his name. I got the name in my head, but he was hilarious. So he did me a good deed. I, I would go give him cash and I'd build up this silver collection. And then at that time I was like, man, but what about this like manipulation of the silver markets? I see the physical market, but I'm also seeing this other market where the price is controlled. And if you look at it, it's not just one-to-one -one, it's like, thousand to one shares of gold and silver they're issuing for one one coin so if it you know only one person's gonna out of a thousand is gonna get out the door at that so i really realized that while gold and silver are awesome it was the scarcity i was attracted to and that proof of work from mining um i just saw the flaws in it i think the the system has already captured it a little bit and 2013 i was online on private internet access.com because i'm also into privacy on all levels and that includes on the computer and so I was looking at some VPNs and I was so irritated that I had to use a credit card and surrender my name and all my information I can't remember what the one was but I went to two or three and I finally came to private internet access and I was like what are their payment options I was actually looking for like mail and cash or something and then I see the little bitcoin logo tilted there and I was like what the hell is this thing I've never seen this go to google bitcoin white paper pops up and literally, I was armed, ready for this white paper. I was, I had the financial education. I had the, the network education. I had the money education. It was all primed. And I didn't need the 10,000 hours. I That night, I was on Craigslist buying Bitcoin from some like random guy at Safeway. And <clears throat> yeah, that was I fell down the rabbit hole hard. And I became essentially like a Bitcoin Jesus, uh, like a Roger Ver Bitcoin Jesus, but not really digitally, but in my own circle at work and in my family, I couldn't shut up about Bitcoin for probably seven years or something. And then I think we all hit this point three, four, five years ago where it's like, okay, I just got sick of talking about it because no one, no one would hear me out. 
I worked with some mm. of the smartest engineers in the world for RF engineers, and they all thought it was a Ponzi scheme. And they're just like, that's stupid. That's some, that's some dumb thing. What is, what is this Satoshi guy again? He's just going to spend his coins. I'm like, dude, you can look, you're a software expert. How come you won't look into it? You're sitting here buying real estate to make money. So how come you won't look into Bitcoin? And so, you know, I'd, I'd be in the lunchroom and people would come in to lunch and there's, oh, here comes Bitcoin Rob. That's the name I got. Even people's wives and children would call me Bitcoin Rob at like work events. And yeah, I just was so into it because I just saw this, this massive amount of freedom. It was the way we can finally get control back to the system grassroots. It's not some top down approach. It was just this beautiful thing to me and it still is. And, but you, more recently, I, you know, people are set in their ways and I don't really talk about it very much. And, but it, unless someone is interested, then yeah, I remember four years ago, the guy that came and trimmed our trees, he, we, it was like 10 grand or something. And I tipped him 500 bucks in Bitcoin. And that was a long time ago. And he came by, he just randomly stopped by my house years later. And I was like, dude, you changed my life about this. I've never, never seen it the way you explained it. And I was like, yes, it's so rewarding to get someone else to see it. And it's, it's kind of a tragedy in my life because I couldn't, the only people I could really get interested in Bitcoin was my mom and uncle and a few friends, you know, and then my few friends sold it for Ethereum or sold, sold the very bottom. I'm like, no, 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 no. You did everything I told you not to do. So I, I feel like a lot of Bitcoiners have a similar experience with that, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a diehard. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it. I, I, I really relate to your experience there. Uh, I definitely uh, screamed at too many people early on in uh, what I thought was just, you know, passionate and helpful uh, manner. Uh, but, you know, no one wants to sound like they're in a cult or be screamed at by a cult member. Uh, I also love IT guys and girls who uh, who love real estate, especially investing in real estate, but just do not get Bitcoin. Uh, they're my favorite. Um, but how did you, uh, you mentioned it briefly, but like, what's your way of buying Bitcoin? Are you, are you on an exchange? Are you getting KYC Bitcoin um, or something so else? In the very early days, actually the first coins I bought were like, face to face in cash with, with people. And then I remember I needed more volume. And so I went to Coinbase. This was like Coinbase very first year of it operating. And I was on Coinbase for that first year. And then I realized this is not the Bitcoin way. And then I got, and I've always been like a self custody person. I don't leave any coins on the exchange. I'm, I'm probably the Bitcoin or the Bitcoin network needs. I, I self custody. I, you know, I run my own nodes. I've probably spun up hundred nodes in my last, since 2013 um but yeah i'd say i acquired most of it in cash because that's a very important aspect to me about bitcoin is is meeting someone another bitcoiner and doing that exchange and i knew right away that when i bought bitcoin on coinbase i knew i was just getting a, a number in a database i didn't actually own the bitcoin until i took it off the exchange and i learned that from the way the dollar system works and, and silver and gold and so I was a type of person I bought some on Coinbase and I instantly pulled them off. I never keep them on there. And I don't know if this is why I never got into altcoins, but I was around before Litecoin was around. And so when these other altcoins came around, you know, I'm just like, no, these are these are just copies and clones. And then it proliferated into massive it was the altcoins and then it was the dark coins and then it was the ICOs and the DAOs and all this junk that's just been going on and booms and busts. A few millionaires were made for the loss of many. Um, I mean, I, I've had my days trading. I don't trade because I'm a terrible trader. I probably tried it like a dozen times and, you know, did really good and then lost it all. So I'm definitely not a trader. I don't do that anymore. Um I've played around with some altcoins back in the day, but with the assumption that I wanted more Bitcoin, I never, I never strayed away from the fact that it's Bitcoin. I love that. And what has it been like, you know, having a Bitcoin focused company, um, or at least a company that prefers to, you know, receive Bitcoin? Uh, I like the way Ben Justman, you know, kind of looks at it with his wine, where it's like he's in, in, buy, in, in, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but in imbuing the his company's vibe on Bitcoin, 
and not so much vice versa uh, the other way. And I think that's what you're doing as well. You know, you're just a great product and you accept Bitcoin. Um, but but I know that a lot of uh, your customers are Bitcoiners. So what is it like being in like a Bitcoin circular economy? What's been that experience been like? It's the most rewarding thing to to get in 2023. We received about 45 percent of our total sales volume in BTC pay. And I don't say Bitcoin because we do accept Monero. We have a diehard group of Alpha customers who are very privacy oriented and they're into Monero. And I and I know I've been through all the altcoins and that's the only one I'm, I'm okay with. So we take Monero and Bitcoin. And so during 2023, we saw about 45% of our sales through Monero, or sorry, BTC Pay. Very small fraction of that was Monero. Uh, it was about half Bitcoin, half Lightning. So it's it's an amazing feeling when you you just see these UTXOs coming in and then your rancher takes Bitcoin as payment for beef. So I think we're one of the few companies, I don't know of very many other ones that actually have a full circular loop in Bitcoin. Now, only half of our beef inputs come from the rancher that accepts Bitcoin. And the other half, I'm trying to waken them up, but their family has a history of like bankers and they're, they're anti-Bitcoin. I'm like, all right, whatever, it's fine. But when we get to do that circular economy, our customers pay us in Bitcoin, we accumulate that Bitcoin, and then we have a large chunk sent out to buy beef. We make bars, we sell it in Bitcoin. It's, it's awesome. I mean, I didn't expect nearly 50% of our sales in 2023 to come from Bitcoin. And it's just been an amazing experience. I mean, with that said, I, I had a feeling since I have been on Bitcoin Twitter forever and, you know, in the dark, I'm not a someone that rises to the surface and, and pretty private, but I saw a need for this product and I knew Bitcoiners would respect it. And I know that Bitcoiners know that when there's a Bitcoin product, it's typically really high grade, really high quality. Bitcoiners usually don't make trash. Like if I see someone selling something for Bitcoin, I, I pretty much know it's going to be high quality. Not all the time, but most of the time. So yeah, it's just a really rewarding experience. Um, and I think we filled a hole in the Bitcoiners that a lot of people don't spend their Bitcoin, but I think our product actually is one of the few things that will make Bitcoiners part with their Bitcoin. Yeah, that's what I love. I hate spending my Bitcoin, but I like when uh, a vendor demands or prefers Bitcoin because then I really have to value it at a very different level, but I feel like we're bonding on a whole different uh, level. Uh, right. And it's the way, I don't want to use the word barter, but the way exchange should be value mm -hmm. for value. And it seems just more real. And uh, if I'm parting with my sats, then I'm getting something awesome. Right. Uh, and if someone's demanding sats, well, they're probably offering something awesome because it's pretty, uh, it would be like a huge humble brick to be like, I'm mm -hmm. only taking sats for this garbage. Right. Uh, and, and we don't take only Bitcoin because we just couldn't survive and pay our dues. So we, we take credit cards too. I mean, if I had it my way, we wouldn't take, you know, credit cards. We'd do it all Bitcoin. And part of my mission, our mission of Alpa is to drive more Bitcoin adoption. We want to, so at the beginning we were like, should we charge 10% more and punish fiat customers and just have Bitcoin priced as is, or should we reward Bitcoin customers and keep the fiat as is? And I, it was a tough battle, but I decided I don't want to frame it negatively. So we we definitely discount 10% on Bitcoin purchases right now. Right. That makes sense. And uh, what, what what do you think is next for, you know, Alpha Bars? Uh, what's, what's the bigger vision? So I don't think we have a vision like we've been trained to think. I don't want to blow Alpha. I don't have this vision of making it like big that General Mills will buy it and you know, buy us out for millions of dollars. I definitely want to grow it um, and come out with more products. We have probably like five or six different bars that we want to make, uh, a, a no honey, zero car bar included in that. Um, and even more bars oriented to like young kids and like children and to try to hit their palates. And, you know, we will fail as a company if we ever add some industrial sludge. So with that being said, anything we come out with, we'll stick to these natural ingredients you know just like we have in the past or 
So what, uh, I would love there. to riff on what natural ingredients you'll you'll throw in because I got a couple here I want to offer up that make no sense maybe, but throw them at me. No, you go first. Oh, so you know, natural ingredients like the just what comes from a farm. So we don't want to add anything into our bar that a, a typical farm couldn't produce. You know, we get a lot of people saying, why don't you put allulose in it or monk fruit or stevia and all these things? And I'm like, well, go look at where those come from. Go look at it. It takes a laboratory to make those. That is a ultra processed food. I don't care if it's zero carb um, or probably doesn't have that many side effects or whatever. It's just not part of our mission. Our mission is to use honey because it comes from a small local farm and you don't you don't have some massive capital requirement to make honey you don't need a massive skill set just some farmer and rancher could do it and that's what we want to prop up is our we want money funding into small ranchers small-time farmers because we understand that to fix this food system is local and small um but yeah in terms of ingredients we want to keep it to what comes from a farm we don't want to kind of so what would be, say, uh, yeah. Do you have uh, maybe a couple it. that would be favorite of yours that not, you know, to maybe go to next if it came um, from a farm and you could source so in it. different ingredients? Yeah. Could you name some, a couple ingredients you'd be interested I mean, in? Bone broth is one that we're looking at. Um, maybe different types of nuts and berries. If we can find some that are locally based. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much a reformulation of that same group of ingredients so we actually have been making this carbonated animal-based drink which sounds nuts and it's not just blood um it's like some bone broth mixed with some other ingredients um we could add maybe some like dairy into it a lot of people don't like dairy though so it's that's the one thing i've learned running a business is you know i never realized some people wouldn't eat our bar because there's butter in it and now i understand you know some people are dairy intolerant and can't um but yeah, I really think it's pretty much a reformulation of these base ingredients. Yeah, so I did get a food test. And uh, the one thing I, that like really was just a little bit over the line was uh, lactose milk, uh, cow, not goat. And I've always ca ca called myself uh, lactose annoyed my whole life. Mm. Um, and I found that out that there might be something. But you know, it's like mild and I still, you know, I'll have pizza once in a while or uh, things like that. So this um, is like a N equals one, but statistics, my wife was, she couldn't do milk since I met her, um, up to like three years ago, she would have gut reactions and just not make her feel good. She came up on these allergy tests for milk and dairy. And then years ago, we started getting raw goat milk and we started getting into raw goat milk. And then we found raw cow milk and we should drink raw cow milk and feel great. And now we don't really get pasteurized milk too often anymore. Sometimes we do, but she thinks that raw milk has fixed her dairy intolerance. Right. And, and I've actually heard it more than once. Um, but now she can just even drink pasteurized milk and have no problems with it. As long as there's like a lot of raw milk in the background. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't really desire milk, uh, but I like it when it's in like either like a mozzarella cheese uh, and only on my pizza or like my pasta, Same. my ziti or something. And, so a little, you know, it, it finds my way into my diet in very small ways that don't bother me. But I do, we, we, as a family, and it's not necessarily me as a partaker, but we're moving to raw milk. And um, yeah, I, I kind of enjoy this whole movement of just moving to small, local, fresher, right from the farm. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Raw milk ice cream is great. You can turn ice cream into a health food by making it with raw milk and so simple so, ingredients the couple ingredients that came to my mind and i'm just getting a little maybe fantastical here but the bar reminded me a little bit of maybe how i would I'd view like a stout like a beer again sort of how it has like a backbone to it and uh i'm an ipa guy but i enjoy once in a while like a stout or a barrel aged stout and sometimes uh, something that kind of like uh goes well with that is like coffee or cocoa beans uh, mm -hmm. and i have no idea if that would ever you know maybe play a role maybe that's just crazy but Right. So we actually made a uh, cocoa and chocolate version of, or a coffee bean and cocoa version of it early on when we were kind of figuring things out for ourselves. And it's a pretty good combination. Um, I think we just need to. So, yeah, I think we could. It 
depends on if we want to start getting into ingredients that maybe aren't locally sourced. Um, that's kind of the stipulation there, but yeah, that's funny you bring that up because we've actually made one with ground coffee in it and cocoa. Nice. It's pretty good. And then maybe grapes too. Uh, grapes would be okay. They're easily grown on farms. Yeah, it might be interesting. So again, and it's all, and it comes back for the bar. It comes back to getting that water activity down. So grapes might not mm. be the most cost effective one unless we buy them dehydrated because grapes right. are almost all water. So we would essentially buy grapes by the, the pound grape. and then evaporate the whole <laughs> thing out. Yeah. That's yeah. Cause uh, back to that, I mean, <laughs> beef, when you dehydrate beef, it's about uh, 75, 50 to 75% water. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so I've been getting my beef through the Florida beef initiative here in circle six farms ranch. And, uh, we're doing an event this weekend with Texas Slim in Tampa. But um, one of the things, we're, we're going through the process of getting a quarter cow now. And, uh, you know, you just find, I mean, like what the cow weighs at cutting and trimming is very different than, you know, the delivery weight of the quarter cow. Well, yeah, then you stick it in a dehydrator and then you get like, wow, it shrinks really quickly. <laughs> Great. Where'd it go? And so uh, I, I think my final question for you you know, kind of going into the pandemic and everything going on, how much do you think, you know, just your Bitcoin journey uh, impacted the way you handled COVID and, and everything, you know, versus maybe if Bitcoin didn't exist and you weren't aware of the, the sovereignty principles, the self-sovereignty principles that you gain. And I feel that it's, no matter how small your stack is, you get that from your first few sats. Just this, this notion becomes a, an idea that's embedded in your mind. Like I own this thing and nobody else can come between me and it. It doesn't matter how much you have of it. And, and for me, I felt that being a, a Bitcoiner, and I use that label lightly because I'm not, I don't label myself as anything, but just having that mindset of and having found the truth in Bitcoin, that it really impacted how I handled COVID for myself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even before COVID, I looked at Bitcoin like this, you know, I'm not super doomsday, but I looked at it like kind of one of the only shining beacons of hope that's left. I mean, everything else is deteriorating around us and COVID really lift my spirit a lot or Bitcoin really lift my spirit a lot. Oh, and I'd say absolutely it armed me for COVID. Um, you know, for like the first month of COVID, it's pretty wise to treat it like it's pretty dangerous. It's an unknown yeah, passage. You, you don't know. I mean, I know. a couple months in, but once you kind of see it and then you see the media get involved and in all these authoritarian measures, it's like, okay, no. Um, but yeah, I think Bitcoin really armed me for that. I think it in many ways. And I was always kind of like that anti-authoritarian or anti-authoritative person anyway, but maybe that's why Bitcoin and I get along so well. Yeah, I've always been sort of uh, anti-authoritarian, like, so, or just you know, if someone tells me what to do, I, I'm very much going to question that as my first instinct. And right, you know, and I understand situations and when you have to do things that you're told versus uh, when you could kind of push back. And I pushed back a lot. <laughs> I was the kid who would oh, get, uh, you know, like a 98 uh, across the board at all my my school grades, but the comments would be like disruptive and prevents others from learning. <laughs> and my parents were lifelong public school teachers. And I'd be like, that's bullshit. Like I got a 98. What, what, how could I be the problem? Right. And yeah, I was exactly. the kid being disruptive and prevents others from learning though. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, Bitcoin has changed my life more than pretty much anything I can imagine. I mean, excluding my kids and my family, but yeah. anything uh, you take those, the family kids away is Bitcoin has really it's I don't see there's a difference between me and Bitcoin. Like I am Bitcoin. Right. And I think we in some ways, Bitcoin uh, sat should have been Bitcoin and we should have had 100 million Bitcoins per whatever. And, you know, I think of my wife and kids as my first three sats or Bitcoin. Nice. Um, and, my, you know, definitely, you know, lifelong trades uh, one way. Uh, so I'll cheat. My final, final question for you is why do you troll the vegans? Why do you meme the vegans? So part of that is part of the story of where we created the bar. So I, we just had these, I have these memories and this, these true stories of us going down like Safeway and Whole Foods and going down the bar aisle. 
And all you see is plant-based, vegan, plant-based, vegan. And then you see the impossible me and the whatever the other one is, all these artificial chickens mm. coming out. And it, you just look at it. You don't have to have that much of a brain to realize that it's just ultra processed junk. I mean, if you want to be a vegan, I know one really good vegan and that person eats really well. They're not eating these fake meat products. They're not eating these fake vegan bars. So it's just kind of funny because our bar was the opposite of a vegan bar. Like ours would, our package says animal based. Um, so we thought it would be a pretty good marketing thing to not, to not like be mean, but kind of like play on the the vegan bars and like just that Chad mentality of being a carnivore and, you know, not eating this industrial slop and thinking it's healthy. No, nah, that's great. Love it. We've kind of, we've kind of tuned down from the early days of that, but well, I was a vegetarian for like 12 years. Right. I mean, I experimented actually. Yeah. I experimented around with like no meat probably 10 years ago or something. And I was all into smoothies at that time. And, you know, I felt great. And there's no reason our, our bodies are so amazing. Like you can have a vegan that's super healthy. It doesn't, you don't have mm. to be a meat eater to be healthy. I think you just have to do it right. I think the, the key here is just avoiding this industrial sludge. And I think yeah. Sa Saifedean coined that term, industrial sludge. And I saw that years ago and I've never let go of that term. Yeah, fiat food. And uh, really Texas Slim really helped me think through that just in terms of, you know, when you create fake money, you have to create fake industries around it. Mm -hmm. and it was a great way of kind of explaining margarine, you know, and why we had to replace beef and tallow and ghee because uh, we just needed to insert cheaper food stuff into uh you know the f the food to keep the prices down in a way right. uh but you know fake money fake food uh fake defense fake borders uh, all of it you know it, it's a fiat way it's a fiat way yeah and like most of the vegan stuff you see is like like the fake chicken and the fake beef is like who's gonna eat that i mean i think there's very small small amount of people who think that's good and eat that i don't know well you know you i mean like it's a lot you know you experiment with things and you experiment with things i think socially culturally and from a health perspective and you know for the first six months when i gave up meat i actually felt a little better right and then i got into the grain the you know the what is it the grain oh, yeah. brain 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 yeah and but you know it, and then then that's like being a frog in water boiling water and you don't know it and you don't don't know why your brain is foggy you're just like i can't think uh, but, you know, thinking through what, you know, it's kind of like, um, I, I think it's Adam Meister who kind of coined it or so that, you know, that that sort of that like that altruistic uh, notion of doing good, but really harming yourself through, mm -hmm. you know, the way the mantra is with the, with the media and society today. Uh, so, you know, you know, harming yourself is like doing good. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I respect everyone's way of eating and stuff, but it's it's kind of funny you know, the vegan mindset is kind of framed towards like, we do no harm. We are in perfect harmony with this planet and we don't do any harm. We don't end the life of any species or anything. And it's just not true. I mean, vegans require big monocultures and big monocrops. And with that comes pesticides and all this other stuff. You know, they eradicate hundreds of acres of land that other animals are living on and just regenerative beef is just like this ray of hope where you just see this big biodiversity and this like permaculture mindset. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, what I love about what you're doing is, you know, uh, Giacomo, um, you know, had this great presentation uh, in, when I went to the ocean launch in South Carolina, Giacomo Zucamo. And, uh, you know, it was, it was on the way back from, you know, South Carolina where I was caught in an airport. And uh, but speaking with Giacomo, uh, I'll touch on this. So Giacomo's presentation was about, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the the people that are game theory, bro. Bitcoin is going to just be fine. And you have the people who are like, uh, no matter what happens, uh, you know, it's just it's Bitcoin's going to fail. And so you have sort of uh, hopium and self-defeating out attitude. And in between. Right. You have the people who are like, I, I believe in Bitcoin, but we're going to be the actors here who are going to get it over the finish line. And it's the same thing with food. And, and that's what you're doing with Alpa 
is you're in the space and you're giving us options. And so coming back from that conference, I'm caught in the airport. And, you know, before Alpha Bars, um, I'd be caught in the airport and fuck. And I started buying the Snickers, you know, the two for six dollar Snickers that they sell you yeah. at the airport instead of the damn cliff bar. And um, you know, it, I, it would be one of the most frustrating life experiences being in that airport. And especially now with uh, rampant inflation, spending like, you know, nine dollars Snickers bar. And it's like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? And I don't feel good after eating this stuff. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, then there's the, you know, I could fast it out and, and I I don't mind skipping a meal or two. But sometimes you just you, you want something, whether it's a snack or, you know, a meal replacement you know, or some fuel for the burn. So I love what you're doing. I'll leave it to you for any parting words and let people know where they can find, you know, you and, and Alpa and, and the bars. Yeah, we're, we're very honored to be doing what we're doing. And we're glad we've had such a, such a big supporting. And our, the goal we set for 2023 was far too low and we outperformed that greatly. And there's going to be more great things to come from us. Um, if you haven't tried them, use whatever affiliate code you can get pay in bitcoin i think matrix. you have affiliate code matrix so use code matrix um pay in bitcoin you get 10 percent back uh your money literally goes to a small family and it gets recycled right back into small colorado farms and some oregon farms or berries and yeah we were having a great time i'm so stoked that we figured out how to fuse bitcoin and beef in our business and just the two rabbit holes I fell down in my life are now fused together with Alpa. And yeah, I'm very honored to be doing it. So and I appreciate you inviting me on your podcast. You can find us at eatalpa.com and our Twitter handle is also eatalpa. We have an Instagram, uh, eatalpa. It's not very, very popular. We use Twitter mostly. So yeah, and you get to eat uh, good food made with real meat. Exactly. So uh, this has been so dope. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, I've had a great time, Cedric. Hey, hey, that's a wrap on today's episode of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast with Rob Rebick, the co-founder of Alpha Energy Bars. I hope that you found it as enjoyable and enlightening as I did. Hit us up. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you could write a five-star review for the Bitcoin Matrix podcast, wherever you listen to your pods, that would really help us get the word out and help new listeners to find the show. Finally, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Keep building, keep stacking, and always stay laser-focused out there. This is Cedric. Peace. Peace.